Hey guys, Rob here with McDojo Life. Just getting the day going real fast. I'd like to thank my sponsors because, God damn it, I like money. Thank you guys so much for paying me. Uh, Gold BJJ, I actually really enjoy their stuff. They have Dean Lister on there regularly who's showing techniques. Love that. Love the stuff that he puts out. Um, also, I'd like to thank Fight Back CBD. Thank you guys so much because I'm in constant state of pain and they help with that. So I appreciate you guys. Uh, today, I have a legend in the house, which I am very grateful for that he has showed up to talk with us today. Very grateful about that. Also has a podcast that he's doing now, which I quite enjoy. I've been watching for a little while now. Um, and it is the man himself, Big John McCarthy. What is going on, man? How you doing, brother? Everything good? Everything's good. Just living the dream. You know, I get up every day. I walk. I sit back down. I go to bed. I do it again. <laughs> I want you to know, man, I love the stuff you put out. It is hysterical. It's classic. And sometimes it gets to the point I just, I'm shaking my head going, are you kidding me? How stupid are these people? But it's awesome to watch. So thank you. Yeah, it, man, it's, it's, it's a strange industry I got myself into because it didn't exist until I started doing it. And then all of a sudden people were like, oh, this this is real? People really believe this? And I guess up to the certain point, they just thought that people were just making fun of stuff or joking around. And then when they realized that those people were real, they were like, good Lord, these things are very culty. <laughs> good culty. Lord. Yeah, they are. It's You know what? It's weird. It's very much, you, you watch some, some religions and the way people act during some of the sermons and some of these... Uh, evangelical people out there that can uh, touch people and heal them and stuff. The martial arts has the same thing. It's a bunch of snake oil. Have you ever like dealt with that kind of stuff? I mean, you've been in the industry for a long time, which I'm sure we will get to, but I'm just curious if you've ever had to deal with any of that. Oh yeah. Oh, okay. Absolutely. That's, you know, I, you know what? The truth of the matter is I, how I started out with uh, the Gracie's was based upon an incident that occurred uh, when I was on LAPD and they, they brought together back in, uh, after the Rodney King incident, they brought together this panel for a martial arts review board. And it had all these, all the martial artists that you could, you know, what, you know, you would see them all, all the covers of black belt and everything. And they had this, you know, area that was set up and we were sitting at tables. And, and I, I knew a couple of the guys that were there and didn't know a lot of them. And, there was a guy that was doing a demonstration and I was just sitting there with my hand on my uh, chin and he looked at me and he picked me out and he says, you don't seem to think that this works. And <laughs> he was throwing this, he was throwing his student around. And I said, you know, no disrespect to you. I said, but he's letting you do that. It's different if the person doesn't let you do that. And if they're doing something back to you. And he, he asked me to come up there and I went up there and I did something with him and it didn't turn out very well for him. And I got yelled at by, by my boss who had brought me and I go back to my seat and a guy comes over and sits down next to me and it was Horry and Gracie. Mm. And he started talking to me about, Hey, where do you work out? And that's how I actually started with the Gracie. So no shit. Not that the one guy was fake. It's just that look at real is real. When someone's trying to actually do something to you in return, mm. that's a real situation. It's even different than what I call resistance. Mm. You can have guys that, you know, they're doing something and someone is just kind of resisting what they're doing, not trying to hurt them back. Yeah. And it's a different situation when someone is actually trying to hurt you and you have to deal with that. That's real life, and that's where you better be good at what you do, or bad things can happen to you. Yeah, it's a it's it's a shame. It's actually super dangerous, in my opinion, to give people a false sense of security in, in terms of self defense because it's very easy to brainwash people, unfortunately, and to get them to go along. And I've seen it in every art, every art period. I don't think in the last twenty two years of doing this that I haven't seen it. Um, you know, jujitsu has its own culty ways and judo has its own culty ways. They all do. You know, there's a hierarchy. And when you have a hierarchy of anything, there'll eventually be someone to take advantage of people. That's just how it is, right? Um, but you're in a unique position. And I got a chance to talk to Mike Beltran about this. And now I have to say that I, I feel like I'm really friends with Mike. I mean, I got a chance to meet him when I was out in L.A. He I am picked so me up sorry. from the airport. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny because he didn't say anything but good things about you. So, <laughs> Mike is Mike is a great guy. Yeah, uh, he's, he's got a look. A lot of people like what? But he's absolutely one of the nicest, sweetest guys there is. Dude, I did not expect him to be so nice. He picked me up from the airport in L.A. We went out. We had some. Uh, 
um, some breakfast. Uh, he took me out to breakfast, um, had some Peruvian food, never had it before. Um, it was great. Um, we got this chance to sit down and chit chat. And that was one of the things that we had talked about is like, you know, you guys are in a unique position because you are kind of front. You you have the best seats in the house to any fight, period. <laughs> you know, so you guys get the opportunity to watch what is real all the time and not just the upper levels too. But I mean, you guys have done amateur shows in your life. You guys have worked with guys who were just starting O and O pros who are having to shake off the dust. I mean, you guys have done it all. And for you, you started at the very, very, very beginning. And I'm not talking about Pancrase and I'm not talking about overseas or anything like that. I'm just talking about UFC in general. You were the first guy. So how did that come about? How did you become the guy? <laughs> I actually, you know, I became, uh, I got that job off of UFC one and, uh, I was at UFC one. I was actually a sparring partner for Hoist Gracie training, you know, in Denver before the show and stuff. My wife was actually working, um, for Horian and Gracie, uh, setting up the travel and, uh, the banquet air banquet thing that they had afterwards and everything. But, um, the very first fight that happened in the UFC was Taylor Tooley versus Gerard Gerdau. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the fight that got me my job because Horian had brought in two officials from Brazil, a guy named Jao Bejeto and Elio Veggio. And uh, Jao Bejeto had that first fight. And what, you know, there was actually three rules in the first UFC. And the three rules were there was no biting, no eye gouging, and no groin strikes. Everything else you could do. But for the official, for the referee, the only way that the fight was supposed to stop was the fighter was to tap out or mm -hmm. the corner was to throw in the towel. Other than that, the fight wasn't supposed to be stopped. Even off a knockout, when you look back at that, and that's what happened with me at UFC, you go, that's ridiculous. But Dude, he got kicked in the teeth, I do believe. A oh, tooth yeah, he got kicked flew out. Back. I think it, it hit Bill flag. Wallace in the head. <laughs> and Jao Bejeto came in, being a guy that looks and goes, hey, this guy can't, he can't fight this. He's hurt. He's, he's done. He comes in and he stops it, but he wasn't supposed to. Mm. And you'll actually go back. If you watch, you'll see Horian Gracie comes up to the cage and they're arguing back and forth in Portuguese saying, Horian's going, you're not supposed to stop the fight. And, and Jao Bejeto is going, this guy can't fight. <laughs> and finally the corner throws the towel and kind of settles it. But, that's when Horian came to me and said, Hey, I, I need you to, I need you to referee for me. And I, I, I was honest. I said, Horian, I don't know how to referee. <laughs> and, and his, his qualifications for me, when he talking to me, he says, he goes, look, John, he goes, you know, more than just about anybody that's fighting here. He says, you know, you know, you, you train with us, you know, you do, you've done wrestling, you've done boxing. He goes, and you don't mind seeing people get hurt. <laughs> and so that was my qualification. So that's how I actually got, you know, brought in to do UFC too. And, you know, it was a learning experience from the start because there was so much to learn. I, I, I had done a lot of things outside of sports and seen some bad things in my life and been part of some things that probably weren't too nice, but I, I realized quickly that you couldn't trust the corner to do the right thing mm -hmm. because a lot of times the corner was in a position, they believed certain things that just weren't true mm -hmm. or they were told by their fighter, Hey man, never throw that towel in. So they were, I'm not going to throw that towel in. And then the fighter was so hurt they couldn't tap out, and you were stuck in situations that were not good. So it was from that show. After the, after the very first one, I told Horian, I said, he came up to me, he says, that was great, you did great. And I go, I am never doing that again. <laughs> right? And uh, we talked, and that's when I started actually bringing in, look it, if you want me to do it again, I'll do it. If I can stop the fight, if the fighter cannot intelligently defend himself, I have to be able to stop the fight. Mm. And that's how rules started coming into the sport and everything just grew from there. Yeah. It's, it's pretty interesting. So it's, it's funny to hear you talk about your start because when you're watching you in the, in the ring, even back then you, you had the same presence as you do now, in my opinion, your actual overall presence in the ring, you're kind of watching, you're there if they need you, but if not, eh, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Get it, do your thing. I don't give a shit, <laughs> you know. And it's like, uh, you know. And now over the years, you become kind of the golden standard of of MMA refereeing. I mean, you were the guy who started it. I know that you taught a lot of guys the ropes about how to become a referee in the sport. Um, and I think that it's an amazing thing to to have not only a front row seat, 
But to think about it wasn't that long ago. It wasn't that long ago. It was 93. 93. I mean, shit. I remember watching the first five UFCs on VHS because that's the only place you can get them back in the day. And you had to go to like this back shady section of a of a theater or it like is, a, normally it was back in the porn section. Yeah, it was like it well, it was like porn, and then it was like this one little section that was like you still had to be like over 18 to get back there. Um, I snuck in any damn way because they didn't give a shit. Um, but you know, there was like porn, and then there was this little section that had like faces of death and yep. like basically like all these like movies that you're like, eh, probably shouldn't be filming this shit. And then UFC was back there. And I remember watching the first five. I was at a karate school. And the stigma back in the day, which sometimes still is, but it's changed tremendously because of the UFC and MMA. But um, the stigma was is that if you did jiu-jitsu, jiu-jitsu was super gay. It was like just the gayest thing ever. Grown-ass men rolling around the floor. Gross, right? But then you watched, and you watch UFC 1. And you're like, uh, okay, well, that was, that was pretty cool. Then you watch UFC 2. And the, the opponents seem to get a little bigger. And a little more talented. And then you would watch UFC 3 and you see somebody like, I do believe it was Chemo in UFC 3 that came out. And this man's a fucking monster. A monster of a man, right? And uh, you see him wind up eventually, you know, losing the fight. But I think uh, I think what happened was because of that fight, uh, if I remember correctly, Hoist wasn't able to continue because of the fight, because of an injury or something like that. But still, you got to see that a, a smaller man could still beat someone bigger, and it was all done through just straight-up jiu-jitsu. There wasn't much else tossed in, you know. And his thing back in the day was lunging front kicks, and then he'd shoot in for a low leg single or double or whatever he can get away from, body lock, whatever he can get his hands on. He was yep. kicking. Um, and it was just an incredible moment. What made you start? Like, so you've been doing jujitsu now for a while. Um, what made you really go, you know what? This is something I need in my life. Why not any other art? You know what? It was growing up. My dad was very much into what was real in his mind. He didn't believe in a lot of the martial arts. He believed in, he believed in judo, but there was no judo where we were at. So he believed in amateur wrestling and he believed in boxing. So that's where he sent me. And I really stayed away from most martial arts until I met Horion. And Horion invited me to come train with him and his brothers. And mm. I took him up on the offer. The first guy I ever rolled with was Hoist. Nice. And, you know, I, and when I started with him, I thought, yeah, he's not very good. And I, I have him in a cradle. And he started talking to me while I was putting a lot of pressure. I was big at the time. And he, uh, he ended up arm barring me. And as soon as he arm barred me and, you know, and I tapped – and I, I just looked at him and said, how did you do that? <laughs> I was fat. I fell in love with it. And I just felt what I really fell in love with was exactly what you do by putting out a lot of the videos that you put out. Mm. I have a real problem with people that do fake, mm. that try to, you know, everywhere that I had gone and a lot of people that I trained with, you know, before the graces was, well, we would show you, we would do that, but that, you know, that could, that could cause, you know, death that could, you know, seriously hurt you. You know, we don't want to do that, you know, live and stuff. And everything that I ever brought up with Horian, Hoist, Hickson, everything. Hey, what about this? Let's do it. Let's try it. There was never this mystical anything. It was the let's go. Let's show, let's see it. Let's put a gun in that situation. Let's do this. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, it was that I fell in love with the fact that nothing they did was fake. Everything they did was real. They would do it in real time and they would absolutely put themselves up against anyone to say, I'll prove that my art is real and is better than what you're doing. Yeah, and I, I'm assuming since you've been around them for so long, you probably were maybe front seat to a few Gracie challenge matches at the oh, studio. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah man. Saw quite a few. It was great. <laughs> yeah. What'd you think about those the first time you saw them? Oh, uh, the, the first time we, we, they bring somebody and we all lined up. I was like, oh, they're really going to do this. This is going to be good. Right. And just. <laughs> It was, uh, it's actually on the Gracie and action tapes. You can see them. And, uh, but it was fun. It was, it was, it was funny if you understood what was going on at times, you know, and Horian would do that with his students as far as he would let you, cause they, they had people coming in all the time, mm. all the time. And, you know, a lot of them were, you know, guys, they, they would say, you know, we, uh, we want to you know, challenge you. And Horian was, I'll tell you what, I'll let you go against my student. And if you, you know, if you can do well against my student, then you know maybe you know you can. I'll bring one of my brothers out. Yeah. And you know he would tell you. He says, you know, if if he picked you to to be the person to go with him, you say, you know, just 
Just choke him. Just submit him. Arm bar. Don't hurt him. And so you would go and do exactly what, and the, and the guy would tap out, and he would go right to him and says, "Now he says, you understand? You believe?" And as soon as he says, you know, the guy would say, "Well, yeah." You know, he would make a little thing. He says, "Do you want to try again?" And if the guy said yes, he would oh. go right over to you, and he would look you square in the eyes and goes, "Hurt? I want you to hurt him." Mm. He goes, "Mount him and pound on him." Uh. <laughs> and so it was a, it was just this system that, you know, we all loved it. You know, because again, we felt like, hey, what we do is not fancy. It's not flashy. It it doesn't look like you know the beautiful spinning you know heel kick. But landing that heel kick is not easy. What we do is usually a much more high percentage mm -hmm. in being able to do something to your opponent. And it was yeah, just the truth. You can see that, man, in the Gracie and Action videos. It's, it's actually something I noticed years ago watching it. But that most of the guys who would go their ego would take effect, right? They would go and it was very respectful. I love that to death, right? The guy would be very handshake. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the instructors, head instructors would be standing right there, kind of like as a referee, kind of, yeah. um, really just kind of observing at a closer angle. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, one of the, one of the fighters would be there and it'd be a plethora of guys who would do these challenges because they happened all the damn time. And then the first time, it would be always so simple. It was almost like the formula always worked. It was a double or a single leg takedown or a body lock takedown, followed by uh, mount and or side control. Usually the side control went to mount. The person would almost always go belly down and give up their back. And then it was a rear naked choke, and that was it. And then the guy would stand up, and sometimes they'd be pissed. And sometimes they would be respectful, but they almost always wanted a second go. <laughs> and then, that was like, a mistake. Okay. <laughs> and, then, yeah, and if you watch those second goes, mm -hmm. they're completely different than the first ones. They would just – open hand slaps is all I remember. Belly down, just getting the shit slapped out of them over and over again. Like, that, come on. That was, <laughs> that was to slap some sense into them <laughs> as far as now do you understand. You just This is your second turn. Uh, it's, it was just part of the whole system. And hey, look at it. it's it's one of those things. If you go back, that helped change the martial arts. Truly did. The UFC as a whole helped change the martial arts and took a lot of these the gimmicks away. You know, there's still a lot of techniques out there that you know. In the beginning, we said now nah, that technique probably, that's not going to work in a real fight. Where now fighters are using those techniques and using them very successfully because they have become so adept at the other techniques. Mm. They're not worried about going to the ground. They, they're so good in all ranges of fighting mm. comparative to what in the past was someone was good at one range. Mm. And what is, what is the norm now is exceptional compared to what was in the past. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely agree. I think actually, I think we get these, Every once in a while, just like anything else, just like art has a renaissance phase and just like, you know, music has like its phase where it's like, oh, my God, music has gotten so good. And then it goes to shit again, um, which I think we're in the shit phase right now. But that means there's an upswing coming. There, there you go. <laughs> but uh, martial arts, I think we've had these like giant milestone markers where like, you know, you can got to figure back in the day, Greece, you know, the gladiators and stuff like that. That was probably a huge milestone because it was like, you better learn how to fight or die. <laughs> so they were like, oh, well, I guess we better get good at this shit or be eaten by a lion. <laughs> and then, the, you know, then the other renaissance, you could say that the 70s was a huge kung fu renaissance. You know, kung oh, yeah. theater, Bruce Lee, Chuck Norris, all these amazing guys who were uh, 80s bringing action stars to the forefront. If it wasn't for the 70s guys, there would have been no 80s guys, right? Then 90s, it kind of died, like right about 1990. But then here comes 1993, and the UFC pops up. Boom. Now we're in the middle of this martial arts renaissance. That's still going, in my opinion. Jiu-Jitsu has evolved tremendously even oh, now. You know? So much. I mean, Taekwondo has evolved. Look at guys like Michael Venom Page. Look at guys like Stephen Thompson. Karate, sport karate guys who are having to evolve their art. I mean, all of that thanks to the UFC, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, to mixed martial arts. That's And that's... You can go and look, and I, I, I made it. I made the comment on the one uh, post that you put out with the individual saying that they had gotten a black belt in less than a year, and that yes, he was a deadly fighter, and he could beat Chuck Norris. And it, the part that really started when he when he went into the whole thing with Bruce Lee, 
and he said, well, he was, you know, he was a, you know, an actor. He was a fast, you know, guy, but he couldn't fight. And it's like, really? Well, the one thing that you got to love about what Bruce Lee did was mm-hmm. Bruce Lee was about learning what was effective in a fight. And part mm-hmm. of that was, you know, when, when he was, he was a young actor doing Cato in the Green Hornet, you know, that's when he met Gene LaBelle. Mm. You know, and Gene LaBelle doesn't get enough credit for what he has been to the martial arts and what he has done because Gene LaBelle is the real deal. You know, we, we call him Uncle Gene, you know, for guys that know him and stuff. But Gene is, you know, Gene had an incident with Bruce Lee. Mm. And it was off of that incident that Bruce Lee said, I ne- can you teach me? I need to learn what you know. Yeah, because Gene had grabbed a hold of him and put him in a position that he couldn't get himself out of. And Gene's Bruce, an OG, Bruce was man. actually screaming at him, "I'm going to kill you!" And Gene is sitting down in the chair saying, "Well, I'm not going to let you go because you say you're going to kill me." You know, <laughs> that to happen, and it was a you know kind of funny incident, but there was some seriousness with it. But off of it, you then see Bruce Lee trying to perform arm bars in some of his movies. Yeah, now, it may not be performed correctly the way we would do now. But it was that renaissance and that evolution that he had in his mind of what needed to happen within the martial arts. Look at that had a lot of influence on what exactly what you're saying coming from the 70s into the 80s. And what is, you know, MMA now, you know, all of that is an important history and evolution. And when someone puts somebody down like that, when they're a nothing, it drives me crazy. Yeah, and that guy, particular guy, the whole thing that I posted, it because I always am kind of writing the line between these people being culty, like in a cult, and yeah. these people being almost religious in a way. Or you know, I, I'm still most of the time I think they're just a cult. And this particular guy was actually coming from a place where he said, "Well, he's like a, a evangelist." And so the book that he had written that he was kind of speaking about with with those things was about how martial arts is evil and all martial arts is directly derived from Satan and no martial art comes from any place other than yoga. And it's like, well, you do understand that like boxing is technically a martial art, right? And there's no fucking yoga or praying or alms in that. And you're right. Kickboxing is a martial art. Savat is a martial art that's not derived from yoga or from, uh, you know, the middle East, right? Like, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, it's orient or it, like its origins come from Japan. <laughs> and then, so it's like you're saying all these arts come from Southeast Asia. Like, it's just not true. It's it's a lie. So listen to this guy babble. And the worst part was is the guy's got all these followers, just so many people who are so devout to what he says and they hang on every word. And I feel so bad for them because, like, another video that he did, he's standing in front of a sign for Taekwondo. And he's talking about how, like, it's evil. I was like, you understand that in Korea, where this originates, that the majority of people are atheists. They don't have a religious sect. That's the standard religious sect for Korea is atheist. And he's like, oh, they believe in the devil. No, they actually just don't believe in no, anything. They don't believe <laughs> you in know? Like, you're just talking out your ass. And so, like, to listen to this guy talk about how martial arts is evil, like, and it did so much good in my life and did so much good for me. And I've seen it save so many people from such shitty lives. It's hard to say that it's an evil thing. It's not. First off, you know, and that's exactly what you're saying. I can tell you, the martial arts changed my life. I I was a person who, yeah, I was getting better, but I was out of control in my younger life and the martial arts gives you a discipline. There's a respect value. There's everything that comes with it. That is good. Fighting is one of the greatest things there is because your entire life is a fight. You know, everything you do, having to pay the bills, there's a fight involved because you got to get the money to be able to pay the bills so you can put your kid into that class or that school or whatever it is that's important that they need to get better That's what you as a parent do. So you're fighting the, you know, whatever it is to get to that point where you can actually let your child be in that course. You can pay for it. That's fighting. And you may not be fighting another person, but you're fighting in life and life is a fight. And the martial arts teaches you how to remain composed, how to control your emotions and how to prepare yourself and deal for the fight, which sometimes is not against another human being. That's okay. But everything that the martial arts does for the most part 
is great and is good for everyone and should almost be required as yeah. far as part of education because it absolutely leads certain people onto a path of good where they could have gone the other way. Have you seen Dave Chappelle's new stand-up? No, man, I've heard of it. I've heard a couple of things off of it, but I haven't seen it. I, I, have, to, I have to check it out. So he has a really good bit, and it just kind of goes into what you were saying. But one of the bits that he talks about in the in the movie or in his stand-up, he talks about how uh, training for active shooter situations inside schools. And, uh, you know, that's something that's, you know, it's a hot topic right now. It always is anytime somebody is a fucking moron with a gun. Um, but, you know, he talks about how when you're training the kids and the teachers and staff how to handle that situation, you're technically also training the shooter. <laughs> I mean, he's in the room. He's hanging out, right? It might be. And, and so, like, that was, that's was that been a debate that's happened quite a bit over the years of doing I think I've done McDojo Life now for six years, 22 years in the arts. But a big debate that's happened over the years is, should it be mandatory in schools? And I've always thought that's a fascinating topic because it's so difficult. Because, one, you are teaching people discipline, self-respect. You're teaching them how to control themselves. You're teaching them a lot of things all at once, but you're also teaching them how to possibly be violent if they are a violent person. Yeah. And it's it's kind of a, a, a double-edged sword because, yes, you teach all of these other people how to be good and how to be honorable and respectful and defend themselves. But, man, it would suck so bad if one of those kids was just a complete dick <laughs> and still learned how to – and was good. Now, unfortunately, that happens sometimes. You know, What would you think about that? Like, how would you think that a good way to incorporate that into like the school system would be? Cause it's such a difficult one. You, you've got to look and be honest. You're never going to be able to reach everybody out there with the right message. And there's always someone that can take something you say and can absolutely take it down a road that it was never intended to go down. Mm. But one of the things, you know, discipline is not taking your hand and smacking somebody upside the head. Hmm. That's not what discipline is. Discipline is a form of getting structure in a life. And sometimes that's what a lot of these kids and people need is they need structure. They need something that they, I have to get up at this time in the morning to do this hmm. because that's, that's the routine that has been set for me. And that keeps me on the right path. And everything is about putting someone onto a path where they realize if I work hard, I can make things happen. Now, you, I'm, I'm not the guy that's going to sit there and say, look at, you know, Johnny, what is it you want to be in this world? And you can achieve any of it. Mm. Okay, because there's certain things that Johnny's not going to be. Johnny is, you know, a, a small kid and he wants to be an NBA basketball player. That's probably not going to happen. Okay. Mm. But when it comes to being in the real world, in the business world, in doing things that affect your life in a positive way, Johnny can do any of those things. You set a goal. I always say, if you have a dream, I want you to write your dream down. Once your dream is written down, now it's not a dream, it's a goal. And I want you to tell me, okay, what steps do I have to take to make that goal become a reality? Mm. And let's write those down and now let's start working on those steps. Because you've got to have structure and that's discipline. And that's what the martial arts teaches. Does it teach fighting techniques? Yes. There are a lot of fighting techniques it teaches. Okay. And there's a wide variety of the arts and there's a wide variety of those, those techniques, but Tai Chi is a martial art. Now you're going to see, you'll get some people out there and say, Oh, it shows you how to fight. No, it doesn't. It shows you how to control your body, how to be a physically fit person, how to have some mental acuity and, to be able to utilize, you know, things like meditation and things like that to help yourself as a human being in facing the difficulties of life because everyone's life has troubles. Mm. Everyone has hard times. Everyone has good times. It's just a matter of getting that structure that helps you deal with these moments in life that aren't good and that can work your way through them to get to the good times. That's what I think the, the martial arts is good for for everybody. Mm, I agree. I think it's I think it's fantastic for pretty much anybody. It's you know, it's just so difficult nowadays, I guess. You know, I, the, I think the culture has taken such a hard shift away from, I, I to be honest, masculinity in any way. And yeah. it seems like 
you know, just being honest, like you sound you like Tim at, Kennedy now. <laughs> <laughs> interviewed him not too long ago. Good guy. <laughs> He's a great but, guy. But I, I do think that it really has taken that shift. And I don't think that it's been a I think it's been a slow shift, but I think it has been a shift. And I think that um, you know, in terms of other cultures around the world, they almost all have a rite of passage into manhood. They do. I have a rite of passage, like you do this, like, in the, you know, uh, bar mitzvah is a big one for the Jewish community. You know, there are other cultures in India where you have to like go out and some of it involves like really odd shit. But the truth is, is that they have this passage, like this is the marker. This is the standard. Now you are a man. Here are your responsibilities. And I'm not saying that doesn't apply to women. Women have those same markers across, you know, as well. I think that once you become a mother, I think that that is a standard for guess what? You're not a kid anymore. Suck it up. Now you have to be a real woman, you know? And so when it comes to like martial arts, though, it seems like a lot of people are so anti martial arts because they're not seeing the forest for the trees. They're only seeing, oh, well, MMA is violent and bloody and gory. Well, when you get cut, you kind of bleed. But the idea behind the discipline and all the things you don't see leading up to that fight are huge milestones in that person's life. If no one's ever been through an eight week training camp, you need to do it at least once in your life to understand what you're made out of. I'm just saying it sucks ass. You don't get to eat what you want to eat. You don't get to do what you want to do. You don't get to hang out where you want to hang out. And even worse, if you're on an upper echelon fighter, you don't even sometimes get to say what you want to say. <laughs> so, I mean, I just think it's amazing to me how people try to stray away from it instead of, you know, just saying, well, okay, this is a part of culture. I think a lot of it is comes with a lot of people are just flat out. They're afraid of fighting. They're mm. afraid of that personal confrontation, someone coming at them because the, it, you know, it, no matter what anyone says, and you know, we can get into bullying and things like that. I, I have the personal belief. Everybody has mm. been bullied in their life mm. and everybody has been a bully in some way. Mm. It's part of growing up. Kids start to dominate. You know, they have a small dog in the house. They stick the dog in a drawer or something. That's a bullying. That's a domination. Mm. And it's just part of, the learning as you grow, as you know, you get older as a human being, but this fear of fighting, see people look at the fighting and they, they think that fighters feel the same thing that if someone came up and pushed them and got in their face, they would get this giant rush of adrenaline mm. and they would start to get this shake and they're, they'd be shaky and it may end up that they end up fighting. It may be that they run away, whatever it is, it's okay. But that's the way they look at the world of fighting when that's not what fighting is. Fighting mm. is about competition. If you're going to ask me, is mixed martial arts violent? I'm going to tell you, yes, mm. it is. You know, we punch people, we kick people, we pick people up, we drop them onto a hard surface. Football's we, violent. We wrench, you know, we wrench their arms and legs around in, in ways that they're not supposed to go. It is a violent sport and can be damaging. All right. But it's competition. And it's no different than if you're a, an ice skater or if you're a tennis player. If you're a tennis player, you can only hit the ball against the wall so many times before you say, I want somebody on the other side to be hitting it back at me. And then when you have that, then you want to go up in levels and you, you see this Serena Williams and you go, I want to play against her because I think my skills are as good as hers. And then you'll, you get that chance and she kicks your ass. And you go, <laughs> I got to work on my skills. But that's what fighting is. It's competition. You don't any anybody that thinks a fighter goes in being mad, mm. you're crazy. Because if mm. you go in mad, you're gonna lose. Yeah, you have Your to be mind clear is the greatest tool you have. That is what runs the machine. And if it is altered with anger, you're probably gonna lose. Now you're gonna hear a lot of you know talk between fighters, and that's them trying to build the fight, and that's okay. Mm. But most of the time, even if they don't like the person that they are going to compete against, they're going to settle themselves down. And it's not about anger. Let me just go out and be smart. I actually think that that's why Jose Aldo lost to McGregor. No doubt I think, about it. I think McGregor got into his head, got him angry. Yeah. You Which know, he already a smart fighter. Yeah, he, he set it up. He was like, I know he's going to charge me. He, he worked. You could see it in his his training videos. Step back twice. Right. Or was it left? Right. Yeah. Uh, left, left counter, yeah, left counter, back right. twice, left, boom, drops him, and it was all right, planned. Left, Such right. a premeditated thing, but you're right; it was a very Miyamoto Musashi ish, yeah. you know. But that's part of the whole. That's part of the the mental aspect of fighting is what sometimes separates fighting from all other sports. 
Mm. And, and, and I always say, you know, look at fighting is we don't play fighting. We play football. We play basketball. We play baseball. Fighting is so serious because you are doing things that can damage another human being that it's not a game. We don't play it. Mm. It's serious. But there are certain gamesmanships and mental aspects to it that if you can mentally game someone into a position where they do hate you and they do have anger towards you, like I said, when you're an angry fighter, you usually don't win. Mm. Uh, you can't keep your head clear, man. You don't know what you're supposed to be doing. You're just throwing and hoping. Um, it. You know, it's, it's funny. I have a theory about fighting. I think that you can't lie when you're fighting another human being. <laughs> I think it's the most honest moment you'll ever have with a person. I think that it's, I do personally think that everyone should at least one time in their life, even if they're not what you would consider a violent person or aggressive person, I think they should put on gloves with another human being and go three rounds, three, three <laughs> You want rounds. to kill people. Oh, well, can't I, go think, three rounds. I think that the reason is because it's such an honest moment, because I think most people don't know themselves until they really do get into a fight, whether it be a verbal argument whether, it, you know, because think about spouses when they get into an argument, you know, they're all lovey-dovey and all of a sudden one little thing goes wrong and they get triggered and they pull out shit from five years ago that oh, they've yeah. been storing like a nugget and then they throw it at their person. It's like, well, that means up to this point you've been lying because that's bothered you all the way till now. And then now you're going to say something Well, because you're fighting, you can't lie. Yeah. And so I think that that's the same thing when you're fist fighting somebody. I think how people fight is a direct reflection of who they are as a human being. You know, if they're sneaky, they are a sneaky fighter. If they are direct, they are a direct fighter. You know, um, if they're aggressive, they're an aggressive fighter. If they're kind of passive, they're a passive fighter. And I think that that comes out naturally. You cannot help it. And I think it's the most beautiful moment you'll ever have with another human being. Even just a light sparring, you know. It's it's so true. And it's it's one of those elements where when you're sitting there saying, you know, you, oh, you're, you're an aggressive fighter. You're, you're a person that, you know, you're a sneaky fighter. It actually does play out, and it's a matter of no matter what you intend to do, in the end, what you are comes out. And I tell people when I used to own a gym, and I had a ton of kids, and the parents, the parents were the worst because they tend to start to live their life through the kid, and mm -hmm. it becomes very important that the kid is successful. And it's like, stop. And I, I would tell them, look, you're not here to coach your kid. That's that's my job. That's my instructor's job. I go, you're here to support them. Mm. Just support them because, and, and I would tell, you know, I would get these fathers and I would try to, I'd sit them down and I said, look, there's three kinds of kids. I'm just telling you right now. There's the, there's the kids out there and they're rare. They're in the, you know, maybe 5%, 10% bracket. Uh, it's a kid that he likes contact. Mm. He likes actually being kind of, you know, hit, bumped. He likes being able to do it back. It's fun for him. Mm. But he's he's rare. He's that five or ten percent. Then you've got about, you know, a fifty to sixty percent that they don't like contact, but they can learn how to accept it. They can learn how to mm. deliver it, and they can learn that it's not that bad. Yeah, this is okay. And then you're going to have that thirty thirty five percent that they're never, no matter what you teach them, what anything, they're never going to get it. They don't like it. It mm. is not part of who they are as a person, and that's okay. Yeah. You know, mm. and don't try to make someone something they're not. Mm. You know, if they're not that person that, that is, you know, likes contact or that person that can't learn it, then stay away from it. There's other aspects, you know, of the martial arts they can still utilize that can help prepare them for life. And those the ones that are the 10 percenters, those are usually your fighters. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you got to like to get punched in the face. If you're going to get punched in the face for money. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, you, you, you know, those arm, uh, what do they call them? The backseat senseis, the ones who are yelling at their kids at tournaments and stuff. It's like, shut up. You haven't <laughs> taken a class a day in your life. You have no clue what you're talking about. Sit down. Stop speaking. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, I had a couple it, people it's, chiming it's in. I had some people chiming in here in the comment thread. So let's see here. Um. Mac, uh, Maxence, I don't know how the hell you say his name. <laughs> Maxence, he said, fight. Although I'm pretty sure your tagline is let's get it on. Yeah, usually. <laughs> it used to be. It used to be. You change it up. You ever try something different? <laughs> oh, my God. I tried to stop doing it longer. I, it's funny because that whole thing started with uh, UFC 2. And it wasn't, it wasn't a thought about 
sequence or anything like that. Art Davey was the guy that started the UFC. Mm. He was the guy that was the founder of it. And he pulls me up and he says, he goes, he says, you know, I, I need you to make sure that you start these fights with, you know, I want a hand signal and, and, a, and a statement. I want you to say something. I said, okay, what is it you want? He goes, well, I don't know. I said, well, I don't know either. <laughs> and he goes, he says, well, you got to come up with something. I said, Art, I got two guys standing inside a cage and they're going to want to beat the hell out of each other. I'm going to ask one guy, are you ready? I'm going to ask the other guy, if you're ready, I'm going to tell him, let's get it on. He goes, perfect. That's what I want. <laughs> that's how it started, you know? And then it just, it got to the point where I was like, this isn't, you know, I want to be more invisible. I don't, this, the, the owners of the UFC at a certain point, they wanted me to be this boisterous vocal person. Yeah. And then it got to the point I was like, man, the sport doesn't need that. It's about the fighters. And I actually stopped doing it, and I got yelled at, man. I got, I had people that were all pissed off at me. The promotion was mad at me. I said, "Okay, I'll do it." So I went back to just doing. It. I just did it quieter. You know, I do have, I do have something to bring up actually, because we earlier we were talking about Mike Beltran, and I, like I said, I think Mike's a great guy. Um, obviously, you've known Mike for a long time. Now, recently, I noticed something. I noticed in the last UFC, Mike has has grown out this long old school <laughs> wizard's beard right it looks like a makes him look like a fucking viking right yep. he's not a little guy either so it kind of stands out right the last ufc they had him tuck in his beard i assume it was them yes right? it was it was them yes it was why uh again you know there's there's a lot of personalities out there and yeah. you have to deal with all these personalities and there's ones that uh they'll look and say you want to be noticed. Well, is it that Mike wants to be noticed? No, Mike is just being Mike. And if you yeah. know him, you go, hey, that, that's part of who he is. And it doesn't change the fact. And, and I've had long conversations with people inside the UFC about Mike Beltran and telling him, look, this isn't about how somebody looks. This is, this is about how they perform. Mm. This is about a person that makes good decisions. Mm. You know, and the, for a long time, you know, I've had conversations with Mike about, you know, he could get more assignments working certain promotions if he would cut that off. And, you know, Mike basically told me, he said, John, that's not going to happen. I said, man, you know what? I understand. Mm. You know, he goes, I'm not going to tell something, you know, no one's going to tell me, you know, how I'm going to live my life if I'm doing, if I'm not doing something wrong. And I said, Mike, I totally understand. I just want you to know the ramifications of it. He goes, I don't care. And I said, and I, love you know that. What? I will stand by that. And I love that. I love that about Mike. I like Absolutely. that he is unapologetically himself. And I That's think right. that, you know, what, what's ridiculous to me is the the idea and the concept of the way that the sport is promoted as opposed to the way that they want it to look. Yes. Right. So it's like we really would like it to look like a wholesome family, fun, good time. And then meanwhile, they're like, Khabib, oh, my God, you jumped a cage and you did all that. That's ridiculous. <laughs> meanwhile, they use the Conor McGregor promo video. They use of him the footage of them throwing the handcart through a goddamn bus. Yeah. Right. So you can't you can't have your cake and eat it, too. And I think that one thing that is a beautiful thing about UFC and a beautiful thing about MMA and martial arts in general is there are great personalities. I mean, you're not going to get like your average run in the middle dude fighting people in a cage, right? You're going to get a personality fighting people in a cage. And the same thing should go for the referees. And I don't think there's anything wrong with having personality and being yourself. And if it's some hair, right? I just, who gives a shit, I right? It, it, like I said, it does, like you said, it doesn't affect his performance. He makes amazing decisions. As a matter of fact, he made a great decision one of these last fights where he allowed the fighters to continue to go. And there was way more fight left in it. Even when, in my head, I'm going, eh, maybe we should stop it. But then the fighter got up. He has a good eye. He knows what he's looking at. Yep. It's like, who gives a shit if his hair is out? Like, yeah. I don't know. He's yeah, not it's, cooking. it's one of the things. Being a referee is not what people think. Because, mm -hmm. you know, it. what people want out of you is perfection. Okay, you're supposed to be perfect. All right. And I can tell you, look, it's not what people think. It's not this, oh, you've got the best seat in the house. Yes, you're in a you're in a place where you can create the best position in the house for you to see something, but you have to know what you're doing to get to that position. Mm. And to understand if these guys, this is this is the direction this fight is gonna go. And so you're always being that chess player, kind of putting a chess piece you know, out there in front that, yeah, the fight's leading there, but it can always turn the other way. But, you mm -hmm. know, 
I get this whole thing about there's been so much growth with the officials of the sport, especially the top officials. And I was, you know, doing things for a long time. I got my black belt in jujitsu back in like 2006, I believe, you know, but that was a long progression, but it was all the learning that goes with it that helped me in situations where I'm watching the fight and I go, there's nothing there. And everyone's getting excited. And I go, there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. And so I would stay calm and relaxed and there would be nothing there and the fight would move on. And if you'd have all the commentators yelling and screaming and it was like, come on. And then there's times when I know, Oh, that's close. And I've got the crowd yelling, stand them up. Right. And it's like, you guys have no freaking clue what's about <laughs> to happen here. Yeah. And then all of a sudden there's the tap and I'm stopping the fighter. He's going unconscious. And it's like, you know, that's what can help you as an official. But now, you know, Mike Beltran, he's a brown belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mark Goddard, he's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Jason Herzog is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Jaron Vallel is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You've got all these guys now. They Herb Dean was an MMA fighter too, I do believe. Herb Dean fought in MMA, and Herb Dean is he's a black belt level, and so he doesn't have an official belt. But look at Herb can roll. Herb's good, and they have attained a level that they understand the fighting game way more than people ever realize or give them credit for. They're not just walking in there. Now, are there guys that walk in there that don't have that background? Yeah, there are. But it's no different than anything else. Nothing's perfect. But the top guys that you're looking at, they're well-trained. They care about their craft. They're always asking questions about what about this. You know, anytime I, a big fight happens, I'm getting calls by the guy that was doing the fight. Hey, did you see the fight? Yes, I saw the fight. And we'll talk about it. And I'll tell him, yeah. hey, this, is, this is exactly what you did. And this is, this is why... It was right. But over here, if you would have done this, and it's just a matter of every, every situation, you're just trying to learn. And if you can learn from those situations and be honest about what happened, move on and never let that happen in the same way again, that's how you become great. Yeah. I mean, that's it's, it's got to be the hardest position. I mean, because it's not if, what people think. Yeah. Because I, you know, I, it was also something that me and Mike had talked about. But, you know, if everything goes well, you know, and you do your job well, then people say, good fight they don't say yep. good job ref absolutely you know, if everything goes wrong they go that fucking referee i can't believe he would do that shit and it's like well bitch you weren't there That's it. <laughs> you know you're watching it from a tv screen half the time you can only see my ass and their ass you don't see what's going on in the pile of bodies <laughs> but anyways let's keep going down this list of comments here jeremy he said mcdojo life is awesome you're welcome i do what i can there you go. <laughs> um someone said something negative so fuck you i'm not gonna post your comment um <laughs> He said, uh, David says, John, are you still in Corona? I guess you were in Corona. Oh, man, I am far from Corona. I, I have moved so many times. My wife is the person that we, we we used to actually, you know, buy a house, kind of gut it and redo it and then sell it. And that's how I was, you know, trying to make money for a while doing stuff. But I have finally settled down and uh, I'm on the East Coast now. That's far from Corona, California. I'm on the East Coast, too, man. I love it. <laughs> Got some sunshine down here in Florida. Um Peter Wolf, what did Peter Wolf have to say? He says, are you interviewing an angel? All I can see is a white glow with a face. Whoa. <laughs> like, yes, I am, damn it. No, you're good. You're good. <laughs> How's that? Yeah, I would I would, I would, have had you move a while ago if I couldn't see you. Um, let's see here. And then Kelly Duval said, epic interview. I agree. And I actually will be kind of wrapping this up just a little bit because we've been on here for almost an hour. Time flies, dude. Um, I do like to ask two questions of all of my guests. I always save them for the end because if people don't like to watch till the end, guess what? You're missing out on the best part. Um, <laughs> but I always like to ask people stojo, uh, stories from the dojo. I love a good dojo story, something that could only happen if you were all, you would only know about if you were there personally. You know, it happens all the time in almost every dojo now because obviously we already talked about you going through and witnessing the Gracie's in action, Gracie challenges, stuff like that. I will actually ask you it this way. What is the craziest thing that you remember happening in the ring? I got to know. I'm sure you've been asked before, but I don't know the answer. <laughs> Man, I, it's such a hard I, – I get asked all the time, what was the best fight? What was this? What was it? I've done well over 10,000 fights. I like weird shit, though. I'm, I'm not going to lie. I like the stuff that I'm just like, yeah, that's pretty weird. Like, that's the stuff I enjoy. You know, I, one, of the, one of the ones I always felt bad about, you know, it's a weird situation – uh, we had a fight, and two guys are fighting, and it, this guy puts an umaplata on a, on his opponent, and it's deep, and he keeps on cranking it over, and the other guy is stuck, can't 
can't move out of it, and it's going tighter, tighter, tighter. And all of a sudden, all of the lights in the arena go dark. Boom. It's black. <laughs> that sucks. The only thing that comes on is little emergency lights and thing, right? And I'm like, oh, crap. And I, you know, stop. And I'm like, I'm waiting. Please, God, let the lights turn on so I have to take them out of the position. And no, I got to take them out of the position. So we take them out. And about yeah, five minutes later, the lights come back on. And we try to restart the fight. And I put them back in the same spot. And I'm telling this guy, you know, more, more, crank it more, crank it more. And I'm thinking this guy's arm's going to pop before I even say start, you know, start. But it gets to a certain point and I, I restart the fight. But that was one that I was like, it was just so wrong that the oh, lights went out at that time. Because that, that guy actually so ended up losing the fight. And I'm like, I wonder what would have happened. That sucks so bad. It does. <laughs> you know, I used to fight in what they would call smoker fights. I'm sure you're aware yeah. of smoker fights. And uh, so when I was 15, I was I was doing these smoker fights. And the only reason I was allowed in this nightclub was because the promoter was my instructor. And he needed somebody to help tear down and set up the cage. And I was one of the only people to help volunteer to lift this heavy-ass thing up and down stairs. Because, like, the cage, like, or not the cage, it was a ring. But I, I apologize, we've been talking about MMA. But the ring posts are heavy as shit. Yeah, they are. They're heavy. They're solid pieces of steel. And so I used to have to help carry these things. I was only like a buck 55 or something like that at the time. And so I would help carry these things. And in exchange, I said, I'll help you, but I want to fight the first fight every night. And he was like, well, you can fight, but you have to leave immediately afterwards. And you can only come back in the club because, you know, it's 21 over drinking and shit. He goes, you can only come back in the club to help tear down the ring. And so I would. And I did this every, it used to be Saturdays. It was a Friday night fights. Then it was Super Slam Sundays. And so I did these Super Slam Sundays and I was actually in school, but I used to do these smoker fights and I, I had to fight these grown ass men because they're the only people who were signing up because it was 21 and up. And so yeah. I, I had these fights and it was just an amazing experience to have. And like when you're dealing with smoker fights, like you were talking about, technical shit goes wrong all the time, right? But two things you always have to have. You always have to have lights, right? And you always have to have an official. And I remember we used to do these fights, but they used to play uh, club music over the, the stereo while the fights were going on. And the announcer would be goading people into fighting and signing up that night while we were in the ring. And he'd be picking at fighters while they were fighting. And so, like, if you were losing the fight, you would hear the announcer heckle you over the microphone, over the PA. But the problem was you couldn't hear a damn thing that the referee was trying to say. Because it's club music. It's loud as shit. So you'd be still steady. Like people be doing the most illegal shit, holding the back of someone's head, uppercutting during a boxing match. And the referee would be like, stop, break, break. But you couldn't hear it because the, the micro dude on the microphone would be like, oh, man, good job. Keep those uppercuts going while the referee's like, fucking stop. So he had to like always get in the way. I remember that referee getting hit so much because he had to step in to say everything he needed to say. Uh. It was it was a piece of my childhood that I just loved so much. <laughs> but um, last thing, I want people to know how they can follow you, um, where they can follow you, how do they keep up with you. Tell them the, the skinny. Give them the, give them the gist of where they can keep up with you. Uh, if you want to follow me on social media, you can go to John McCarthy MMA, either on Twitter or Instagram. I'm on there. If you ask questions, normally I'll answer them. But I uh, also have a podcast with Josh thompson it's called weighing in you can get that on spotify apple um go to youtube and watch it and we do it where you, we film it so you can actually see it and uh we do a uh, pretty good job with that i think right now it's answering some questions of fans and then you can catch me on bellator mma and that's going to be on uh either the zone or right now the paramount network it's going to be switching over shortly i believe but uh Right now, catch on to zone September 28th on to zone. They got the second half of the Featherweight Grand Prix. Yeah, man. You got my homie over there, too, Robin Black, over at the zone. Yeah. Love that dude, man. Like, such oh, a dude, nice yeah. human being. Oh, it's yeah. amazing. <laughs> How many people in the, in the industry are just the coolest people on the planet, but can kill you? <laughs> you know? <laughs> but hey, man, thank you so much for hopping in on live. I really, really, truly am grateful for the opportunity to be able to speak with you. You're a legend in the sport. I think that it's incredible that, that you bring all the wealth of knowledge and all the conversations that we have are very insightful. Thank you so much for taking the time. It means a lot to me. Um, I'm very lucky to be able to, to do this for a living. It's really surreal sometimes that I get to do this for a living now. Um, but yeah, man, thank you so much. And uh, I guess we will catch you later, man. Have a fantastic day. My pleasure. You take care, man.